This episode is brought to you by Gnosis. Gnosis builds decentralized infrastructure for the Ethereum ecosystem. With a rich history dating back to 2015 and products like Safe, CowSwap, or Gnosis Chain, Gnosis combines needs-driven development with deep technical expertise. This year marks the launch of Gnosis Pay, the world's first decentralized payment network. With the Gnosis card, you can spend self-custody crypto at any visa accepting merchant around the world. If you're an individual looking to live more on chain or a business looking to white label the stack, visit GnosisPay.com. There are lots of ways you can join the Gnosis journey. Drop in the Gnosis DAO governance form, become a Gnosis validator with a single GNO token and low cost hardware, or deploy your product on the EVM compatible and highly decentralized Gnosis chain. Get started today at Gnosis.io. Cars One is one of the biggest node operators globally and help you stake your tokens on 45 plus networks like Ethereum, Cosmos, Celestia and DYDX. More than 100,000 delegators stake with Chorus One, including institutions like BitGo and Ledger. Staking with Chorus One not only gets you the highest yields, but also the most robust security practices and infrastructure that are usually exclusive for institutions. You can stake directly to Chorus One's public node from your wallet, set up a white label node, or use the recently launched product, Opus, to stake up to 8,000 ETH in a single transaction. You can even offer high yield staking to your own customers using their API. Your assets always remain in your custody so you can have complete peace of mind. Start staking today at Chorus.one. Hello everyone, uh, I am Meher Roy and today I am catching up with Anish Mohammed, who is the co-founder and CTO and maybe even the lead researcher of Panther Protocol. Panther Protocol is uh, one of the uh, one of the main projects that is operating in the pre-fi space, which is extending you know the notions of privacy that we have in the blockchain area. Right, you have a lot of projects in cryptocurrency where the idea is that a user should be able to transact on a blockchain system. They have full privacy, as in they know only they should be able to know what they did. Um, which makes regulatory compliance hard. And uh, Panther Protocol is taking the approach that, yes, full privacy is valuable, but also there are many use cases where uh, regulatory compliance has to be factored in the privacy equation right from the start. And they're building a project where various kinds of disclosures, various kinds of KYC processes, et cetera, can be put into DeFi workflows. So this is a protocol in development and we'll we'll cover um, the various objectives and where they are in their uh, life cycle. Hi Anish, welcome to the show. Hey, th th thank, you, uh, uh, thank you for having me. So Anish, we have met, uh, I think the last time in 2015. So you, you've been involved in the crypto space for a long, long while. And so tell us uh, your journey of how you how you got into crypto in the first place. Oh, you mean cryptography or crypto crypto? Yeah, crypto, uh, crypto, crypto, like the, the meaning that we stole from cryptography. <laughs> okay, so uh, a full disclosure, a friend of mine, um, there's two part story. One part story is how I got into cryptography mailing list. The other part story is uh, professionally how I got into payment systems. So my first degree is in medicine. After I did my medicine degree in India, I was offered a job by Ericsson in Sweden. Uh, they had a micropayment system called Yalda, Yalda as they call it. And my task was to write a wrapper for open as a cell so we could actually, I mean, I did review and did some work on wrapping it up. So for me, payment systems was something was in my head, like, you know, big problem, offline, double split, right? And the second part of the thread is, uh, I don't know, you're from India, so you probably heard about a silk list. A friend of mine called Uday, Uday Shankar, he runs this list, and he had John Perry, uh, the guy who runs the cryptography mailing list, on the list, and he kind of got me into the list. So, you know, two things happened where 
hey, I had this previous exposure and, you know, having gone to grad school to do cryptography and all those things and being exposed to double spend problem, you're on a cryptography mailing list and you see this and go, wow, interesting. And I shall put my hand up and say, wow, interesting, that's where it ended. I read the thing and then like in 2010, 2011, I think me and Amir Taki among a bunch of people had a workshop in uh, our hackerspace in London and we were explaining to people how to do mining. And for the rest of it, like in 2013, I became an advisor to Ripple and they asked me if I was interested. And when Ethereum happened, again, the same thing in London, Victor Tron actually met me. He asked me if I would help. And then, you know, Ethereum Swarm, I was one of the reviewers of the Warren's paper. I spent a bit of time with the team. Yeah, uh, the story goes on. Like, you know, I've been involved in design, design review of half a dozen layer ones, probably, you know, 18, 20 taps, ZK for a last uh, seven, eight years now. And do I remember it correctly that you also worked for U UBS or no, Lloyd's on Lloyd's Bank? Uh, yeah, Lloyd's and HSBC. Yeah, I was a retail banker. I was my day job. This is all things I did for fun, right? It's like I had, well, I think, I don't know what we met for. I thought robotics. So I have been involved in a whole bunch of things. Cloud, big data, open source robotics, which is drones and crypto, crypto, crypto. So I ran a bunch of meetups everywhere. I don't know what, uh, what is the reason, how we met. I, I still don't recollect, but you know, all these things, anything I get interested, I try put in my effort and you know, these are all my spare time activities. In the last few years, you were building Panther Protocol, which has a, which has a really interesting approach to, to privacy and compliance for, for, for DeFi. Why did you start building this project? What were your initial thoughts? Uh, I, I, I will give you the. It, it's with me is always a story. So I have some spare time, spare time interest in philosophy. So my co-author, his name is Shark Mohan. We wrote a paper like 2011, just looking at uh, the the title of the paper is a new secret. It kind of dec describes the information arbitrage and structures in power. So if you were to think about anything, you know, if you have an information arbitrage, you have a power. I mean, I typically give the example of when uh, society was primitive, there was a language existing and one smart uh, man, woman, whatever, being able to count the number of moon days, uh, you know, how they could be the representative of a moon on earth, like count till 28, 29th day, not happening, go to the mount and sit, so that everybody has, oh, moon god, don't appear today, right? There you go. Next day, they say, oh, moon god, come back. You know, now that the person has said moon god not to come, everybody wants light, so they do hunting in the night. So they they have an uh, you know an alpha in having the moon be predictable. So there, there, there you go. This is an information arbitrage and structures and power. And when uh, crypto came about, I was like, look, uh, there is going to be a real inversion happening. And I've, I've been involved as I was describing like all the big data things and all those things. It's like all the way from cloud to big data, I've been involved very heavily. So for me, I could actually see what is going to come effectively, you know, once the data is all in public. The thing with, you know, blockchains is like a bizarre thing, right? So all the states is visible. All the smart contracts are visible. All the vulnerabilities are visible. And all, everything is visible. So, you know, if you had to apply an ML and do something, both in terms of attacking and recognizing things, which is a bit of a challenge, right? And if you were to look at the traditional, and as, as you were pointing out, like, you know, I've been a retail banker as well. So I've understood finance quite well. So, so I've worked in micro, uh, micropayments, reinsurance, and, uh, you know, finance in a larger sense. So for me, and I did some work for hedge funds and things like that. So for me, I understand trade, you know, trade fine uh, quite well and retail finance and banking well. And I understand the construct of you know KYC, you know, KYC KYT, and, and the value KYC KYT has. Right? It's like you know, it, it could be a limiting factor for anybody. And what you describe as a regulatory arbitrage. If you have two countries, one has a different KYC regime, another one has a KYC regime. There's a regulatory arbitrage there. So I understood all of this, and I looked at it. I went, you know what? We have an opportunity to actually, you know. This is like a two-part story. One part story is like looking into this uh, future and thinking crypto is not going to be the crypto that we see as a tiny bit. It has to go to the space where 
it's a fraction of the TradeFi space, right? Because TradeFi is orders of magnitude bigger and crypto is tiny. And for TradeFi to in enter or crypto to enter TradeFi, we need to have this mechanism where there is equivalence. Equivalence in terms of regulation, equivalence in terms of understanding, equivalence in terms of moving between the two. And, uh, you know, for me and like uh, in my co-founder when we had this chat, for us, it was like this, this the obvious thing, which is like, okay, you have to build, uh, you know, a mechanism by which we could actually have mechanisms that exist in trade five, like dark pools, right? And mechanisms that uh, exist in the, uh, trade five, which is KYC, KYT, build them two together and make it available for DeFi. So this is like the journey of Pantha. Right. In my own, in my own experience, you could think of kind of the conversation around privacy as existing on a on a spectrum so on on the one side you have like bitcoin and ethereum where all your balances are public all your smart contract interactions are public and the day i share my address with the tax authority in one country is is the day they are able to follow me through life and it's obviously non-ideal. I mean, even as an at an individual level, but if I were to think of at like a corporate level, it's it's definitely it's definitely non-ideal. Massive problem. Yeah, your alpha is you know like yeah. The the problem I would describe uh, Meher as something like this: like you and I, for us, our you know you know the half life of data for us is much lesser. Half life for data for enterprises are much bigger. And also the thing is the leverage they have is bigger, right? They could actually do transactions which are orders of magnitude, four, five, six orders of magnitude bigger than us, right? So for them, their strategy has much higher value. For you and me, our strategy, because of multiple reasons, right? The strategy doesn't really have that much of value. For them, it's very high value. So this is the thing that actually happens. So the best example I give is Renaissance Technologies, right? Nobody really tells anybody like how they do it but they have no 30 or 40% return on investment. Even when the market is going down, non-correlated gains, right? And how is that possible? That is possible because their strategy is all private. And how is that possible in a traditional finance? And why is it that it's available for us? Given our volatility, we should have a lot more returns, right? If we were able to have institutions that can actually have both. To me, that's, that's the future of, you know, I, I would say crypto the way I see it. I mean, like, you know, compliant crypto. Right. And on the other side, you have this other part of crypto where it's the Zcash, the Monero, the Tornado Cash, all of these systems, or a dark wallet, Amir Taki is probably the perfect example of it, where you have a generation of technologists that are building privacy systems on crypto where the end objective is that when I, as an individual, transact on crypto, nobody should be able to know uh, what I've done on a crypto system. And and when when I've used those crypto systems, my central challenge ends up becoming that at the end of the year, I have to make a tax statement. How do I even explain to the tax authority, this is a particular shielded pool that I use, that's the input, that's the output, and like, I am fine as a user. I'm not doing something illegal. I... I'm just using a shielded pool because I want to unlink the two and how do I even provide the trace of it to an authority? And I'm sure that the problem is bigger for a company. And so when when you look, when you study kind of like this vision for the you know, dark wallet or dark fi or or these systems, you realize it's it's a vision, right? Like th there is value in it. But I can't actually utilize these tools because for me, in the end, I have to pro I have to provide a a trace of what I did to a tax authority at the end of the year. Yeah, you are in the U.S. You have IRS. IRS has global visibility of everything, and this actually makes it difficult for a bunch of us. So I mean, Amir, as I was saying, like I've known Amir now, I don't know, 14, 13, 14 years now. I told you. He can go on a hackerspace website or some places. You can see pictures of me and him. I believe um, there's a couple of other people there in hackerspace. Like, and I last saw him in Montenegro, right? 
and he invited me to his place. I haven't been there, but I really like him. I like his idea, his ideologies, and he's a very enthusiastic and meticulous person who tries to learn everything. When you meet him, you'll have a bunch of papers printed out in his hat, right? So, uh, you know, credit is where credit is due. He definitely is pushing the envelope. As you rightly pointed out, the talent is exactly what he pointed out, right? So if there is ever a tainted uh, wallet in the mix, you have a bigger problem. because And the problem is the way the law sees this. Not problem is the way that how we can implement it, right? So we need to think this in a way that we, you know, we don't have, it's harder to provide exclusion proofs, right? This is the challenge, right? So we have to actually then filter things in. So when people come in, we need to be able to say that, okay, you know what? We won't allow uh, these set of people that, well, I actually made a list of, so we will have to use a third party, which is outside, who does services to everybody else. So, the, you know, same set of services we can actually consume that traditional trade fi investment banking finance actually uses, right? They could do the KYC, and they could do this almost the same KYT as well. And then the thing is, when you want to reveal these things, you can actually reveal it in different ways. So our initial simple reveal mechanism is like a covet, covet reveal mechanism, where you as a user can actually reveal. I mean, but I should probably say this to you. Yeah, oh, one of the things that everybody should recognize when you do reveal is that you are reducing the privacy set, right? If, you know, imagine there's a pool in which like there are 10 participants, right? Let's say 100 participants and like 50 of them are out of the US, then IRS would definitely get 50 transcripts, right? They have one in half, you know, they have a very good chance of knowing exactly what's happening everywhere. So that is something that everybody needs to understand. And in, in one sense, that is probably not the reason why they're using it, right? So they're using it to actually, uh, you know, guard the alpha. And if IRS recognizes the strategy they are applying, uh, uh, the assumption here is legal, they can look at it, okay, this is a tax, go, that's fine. That That's that's the way we should be thinking about it. Not of the way like, you know, I don't want anybody to see the transaction. The, the thing is like the transaction is, uh, the privacy is bounded. When you walk in, you get privacy shield for while you're doing this thing. When you walk out, you lose it. And at that point in time, you have to reveal all those things. Now you have the transcripts on both ends and there are a bunch of other things that are correlating. So you when you, you know, when you use map, US Meha, where to go back to IRS and say, I deployed, so let's think of an example. You're using Panther, you know, let me walk you through how you come into Panther and you using a Uniswap adapter and you deploying some capital in Uniswap V3 as a liquidity provider and how you're going to submit it to so IRS. So when you as Meha comes in, we are currently using a third party service provider called Purify, P-U-R-I-F-I. And what they do is they would do all the normal things, which is like, you know, they had the whole capacity to do everything. Right now, we are just doing uh, minimal things because we've restricted the total amount of money you could actually you know, transact in the protocol in V1 because, like, you know, it's a test. Everything is being tested out, so we kind of, you know, running things at a minimal level. So once you've actually been uh, going through the KYC process, uh, you know, they, they would do a ECDSA signature on the thing. We have a kind of an interface that's been agreed between us, uh, Panther, one side, and our KYC provider. We can have multiple KYC providers, but at this moment in time, we have one, and uh, we have this interface built. We're using a jab jab, a baby jab jab, and we have a signature that comes in. Once you have the signature, then we would actually have the first set of circuits that actually map you from your KYC wallet to a new set of addresses. In that sense, that is your new address from which you're going to use you know, your assets to do transactions, okay? And now, you go into a multi shielded pool, and there's an adapter to Uniswap, right? So Panther, Uniswap. So in Uniswap, you deployed some liquidity. But when everybody looks at it, it looks like Panther is actually doing it, right? So there could be like, a, you know, 10,000, 1,000, 10,000, whatever that number of users, right? So it's an aggregate of everything you see on outside world. Outside world sees data interaction. So you deployed liquidity in Uniswap V3. Like, I can't remember optimism, whether that airdrop was, and somebody made like three, four mil. So imagine that's the case. Like he, you know, nobody would actually be able to point at you and say, "Hey, may I have this?" No, it'll be like somebody using, uh, you know, whatever. And IRS knows for sure. You, when you submit IRS, IRS would say, "Ah, yes. How did Meher get two million? Meher actually provided this from this point to this point. These other set of transactions, and all of that is clear. Uh, Meher is in the good. Meher keeps his money. 
Where her keeps strategy, where is good, and this app is good, Panther is good. That's how we think we should go forward. That's really cool. It's like the, it's like straddling the the center that is almost absent in crypto. It's like not fully public, but they're not fully trying to build that dark dark fi, right? It's it's like Panther is ultimately straddling that center. And um, it's one of the few projects that is straddling that center and getting into commerce, which is which is the interesting part of it. And and of course, like the complexity is in the is in the technology uh, that 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 makes it happen. So uh, we'll we'll kind of uh, uh, get get into that. So you gave gave this example of um, a Uniswap pool where where uh, maybe. In the beginning, I'm imagining I have something like an Ethereum address. Maybe it's, maybe it's on a different chain. Yeah. I mean, Panther is pretty much on EVM compatible. We have deployed on Polygon. So we are going to deploy in Flare as well. We might deploy another EVM compatible chain. So it is, uh, let's assume an EVM compatible chain and an EVM compatible address, and there exists Unisap. Let's assume those things and then let's get on. Okay. So it's like. Pa- I, I can imagine Panther as kind of a smart contract, multi-asset pool that can that can that can be deployed on, asset pool. Absolutely. on on any of these EVM chains, right? So yes. the, there are some caveats to it, but you know it's like a support for the curves. You know, it's, it's, you know, effectively it's growth sixteen and VL two five So it's like you know, I, the support for libraries, support for the tooling. That's kind of things that are because it's you and because it's me. I want to be very fair. You know, and any of the audience that's listening to, I, I don't want to have a people and make them into thinking. He said this, that's not the case. Yes, there are some nuances to this. When you use ZK, ZK needs to be supported. You know, uh, it, it has to be fast and cheap so we can actually... Support. Like, there is no point in providing privacy for things where it, it doesn't really add value. Like, the key thing is, like, if you were to go to McDonald's and you were to buy a burger, you might get a smoothie. It's unlikely you will ever go to a McDonald's just for the smoothie. Very rare. But, yeah, that's the assumption here. Yeah. Right. So, so then I start off with a normal polygon address. Maybe this is even one that I have given to the tax authorities in the past. And then the first thing is I somehow interact with the, the Panther system on polygon and I, ended, I end okay. up... Okay, so let me walk you through. Yeah, let me walk you through. So uh, uh, you, know, you come in. Uh, if you want to go to Panther, you, as I was describing, you're going to go to Purify. Purify will do the verification. And now you have a derived address. From your first address, you have a derived address. So you have a derived polygon address. The map between the two or the link between the two is only visible to you in that sense. Okay? And now, you ha- with this address, you're going only to... Only visible do- to me, not even to Purify, my KYC provider? Uh, it, it is visible to Purify in the sense like Purify actually has the transcripts, right? So if they decrypt them, then like what they have it, there is literally the transcripts of all the transactions, right? So this map, uh, this bit of the transcript is not fully visible to them. Whatever you do with them, they have the transcripts and that's visible to you, you and them, right? Now, if everything is put together, everything will be visible, right? So on their own, they can't actually, you know, they can only do the first part of it, right? Which is like they can say, these are the transcripts, this is what has happened. And they also have the KYT, right? Uh, you know, if they reveal the KYT plus the KYC, there's lots they can actually reveal. But still, you know, you have to, you know, reveal some of the bits to actually give the fuller picture. So this is where the IRS question when you are mentioning really makes sense. Where, you, you know, you actually want to describe your, trans- your transcripts to them, so it's like a commit reveal mechanism. You have already committed to all these things and you re- do the reveal. They have the whole transcript. And as I was describing, it has some implications of doing that. Just like if you if you and I were the two parties in the transaction and you reveal a mine, then they also know mine as well, right? So yeah, so this is the thing. So now your new address, your derived address, will be in the multi-associated pool, right? And in the multi-associated pool, what you have is a UTX or representing assets, right? And then, you know, normal things like the normal Bitcoin mechanism, right? Uh, you know, the thing, the proof is that this hasn't been seen before. And then you can actually use this to do swaps and trades of that sort, right? So we have two mechanisms in Panther. This is like a Z-trade, which is like a one-to-one map. 
Okay, so sometimes I confuse the two, so forgive me if I do. I've been in this for four years, so I occasionally confuse tree for the woods. So if I use the wrong words for the wrong things, don't shoot me. It's just that my head is so muddled. In my head, there are so many things and things cross wires every now and then. So in a meta level, there's this possibility that you and I, which is Anish and Meher, we could actually swap two assets, assuming we know, you know, we have we are happy with the KYC, we have all this. Okay, so there's this construct I need to describe. The construct is like in Panther, there's this construct called a zone manager. A zone manager actually looks after a zone. A zone is the place where you your KYC is valid, right? And the, the zone manager kind of has to agree to the KYC provider. Okay, this is a KYC requirement I have. You do the KYC, and if this is valid, I will allow this participants to get into the zone, right? And what happens is then between you and me, or we somehow figured out like we, we want to do a swap. We can do a swap. We can do a private swap, right? So, you know, both of us can actually swap things and nobody will be able to figure out what we actually swap. But if you go and then provide IRS's transcript, IRS knows for sure what is done, right? So in that sense, you have the compliance, you have the transcript, you can actually prove that you actually did a legitimate transaction, uh, which is like a swap between asset A to asset B, right? So this is one way. And when this is extended using an adapter, so the adapter is like a think of it like a bridging mechanism, right? One side of the bridge sits on Panther protocol, so there's a multi associate pool, and so the, all the assets are represented uh, in, in the in there, and then the adapter then you know does this backwards into say a normal DeFi product, right? And when the normal DeFi protocol looks, it's, it's it's interacting with the smart contract, and the back end of the smart contract is the assets in the pool, and for the Uniswap, what it looks like is okay. This is the address from which this transaction is happening. And this transaction is within the multi associate pool. Does that make sense? So the imagination I get is, um, imagine like the entire Polygon ecosystem, maybe imagine it as a large large city first, right? So I imagine it as like San Francisco. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a large city and there are different neighborhoods in there. And I, okay, one of those neighborhoods is like kind of like the Panther multi-asset shielded pool in there. And then this Panther multi-asset shielded pool is like further divided into uh, smaller school uh, school areas, let's say like, and, 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 and then you're calling these things, these smaller things zones. So this polygon is the city. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay, so the zone is like uh, top post, right? You can actually think of a school district as a zone, right? And you have like a smaller subunits as like a, smaller maps. You can have multiple maps here, right? And like, you can actually have like, a, I mean, in theory, you can have one mass, but you can have as many maps as you want, right? But the question here is like, you know, how big a mass need to be so it can provide the ineffective, uh, e effective privacy set. So there's a trade-off between, I, I would say a three-way trade-off. What, what is meant by a MASP? A multi-asset shielded pool. Multi-asset shielded pool. So, it's like if Polygon is kind of like San Francisco as a whole, and then it's like um, it's, it's like Panther is kind of like a big area of San Francisco. Yes, yes, yes. A dark area of San Francisco. Dark area of San Francisco. There are like multiple school districts in that dark area. And it's not the case that those multiple school districts are all equ equivalent, right? So because... Because I have to choose what kind of school district I will use, what kind of uh, multi-asset shielded pool I will use. And the better pool is the one that many other users are using because like my anonymity set is kind of the set of users using that school district or that MASP in that case. So the essence of it is kind of, I have an address in like San Francisco, the city in the beginning. And then, like, you have these school districts, these MASPs. You, you have a peer box kind of a map, which you get a new peer box addressed into the school district. That will allow you to participate in that school district. In that school district. And uh, the overall, the top, uh, the, 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 what I call the zone manager, which could be the school district, whoever that is, sets the rules for the games and the thing, which is like, KYC has to be this, you need to meet this and this and this. Then you are allowed to participate uh, within that and 
if you are in there, you can have adapters. So if the school district has, uh, you know, uh, what do I call relationships with other school districts in other places, you are allowed to, meaning I'm just describing a DeFi protocol as a school district, right? So you could actually do that and you can interact with them. Right. So it's like the that school district or that multi-asset shielded pool has some kind of administrator that's that's able a to... A top level administrator. A top, yeah, level, top administrator level administrator that is able to set rules for uh, for that sh uh, shielded pool. And that rule can include that if anyone wants an address to be generated in this pool, then they have to pass KYC across these four or five, either one of these four or five providers, and they could be multiple. Very minimum one, right? Like very minimum one. They can have as many as they want, but, you know, constraints of creating circuits and things like that set aside. I mean, you're absolutely right. So so then I choose kind of like a, I did the district or a, a mass and I look at, okay, they accept KYCs from like these five providers. Currently, there's only one, mm -hmm. but that's because the protocol is young. And then I send this KYC information to, to this provider and then this provider. That's a separate transaction. And and like Panther or, you know, in the class of all Panther protocol shouldn't actually care about this. And just that we... You know, there are no real uh, Web3 service providers that could provide, uh, you know, independently provide you with, uh, you know, uh, a KYC. The challenge is two-part, not just technology, but the regulation, right? Because of the, you know, GDPR and other things, the data ownership is a bit of a problem. So you actually need to get the user to go to the service provider and that KYC, right? And this is one of the challenges we have. We can't actually have the whole thing internal here. Like we can't run. In, in, in a normal world, if you were a bank, you just get uh, you know somebody like on a FIDO to actually provide you with the service. You wrap all those things. You do all those things in one house, right? We have the normal GDPR thing. But because we have a DeFi protocol, which is decentralized, and we, we have to do all of this, we can't do things in a normal way. This is like doing things in somewhat awkward way. So you know we can meet or it's dancing around to making sure that you know, it's like, you know, the kids play the game where they hop around. So the same thing, we have to hop around to make sure that we meet all the requirements that all the regulators have. So I, I, I submitted my KYC and presumably the KYC provider is providing me some kind of certificate. It gives you a, a signature. It's just an ECDS signature on, 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 on a little bit. Yeah, I mean, you get the signature back saying it's valid, right? That's literally what it is. This this account passed KYC KYC with me. That's all. None of the information is revealed. Like, okay, the information lies with the KYC provider in their servers or in their cloud. So the transcript of that thing is in the easiest way of describing. It's like encrypted with their public key. And, you know, it's there. So at any point in time, say, for example, IRS really gets interested you go, that's the KYC provider. Have a word with them. Uh, you know, they, they can provide you with all the details. Well, you know, the rest of the mechanism is normal. Like, you know, if you think about the normal bank, you know, it, it typically once, you know, the, the end user's name and everything is uh, available, uh, you know, the regulatory authority will go directly to URI or whoever the end user is because they can send a subpoena to the user, right? And they can send it to both places, but the user is the easiest. Let's send it to them. We don't have big lawyers. Banks will have big lawyers. So they typically don't go after the banks. They go after the people that it's easier to, you know, you know what I'm saying. So so then this uh, MASP administrator, essentially they have set up the oh, rules. We shouldn't of call them the MASP administrator, right? Like a protocol zone administrator. Because like... There could be multiple, so you know what I'm saying. There's, there could be multiple masks in there, but the, the top level, the zone manager, what they do is like exactly what you like to describe. They make this list. They make an arbitrary rule like what you just described. They could have at least a list of one KYC provider, or they can have as many as they want to. And they describe what their requirement is, right? And they could say, you know, if you were able to prove this and this and this, we will allow you to. And this would be the list of, assets that will be listed in this zone, right? They might say they might not list the cash or Monero or whatever. Up to them, not to us. Then I kind of like get a shielded address of some kind in that uh, in that zone. Yeah. 
and then I might be able to do two things. A, if I'm wanting to do things that are in the zone itself, so another user has a shielded asset in that same zone, then then I could do like a shielded swap with that user. So Anish is yep. in this. Uh, like a, between you and me, like imagine that we were describing, like Anish and Meher, both of us have KYC, we are both in the same zone, run by the same zone manager. Imagine Sebastian to be the zone manager. <laughs> Okay, so we both are here. We can trade between ourselves. Like that is definitely one. Yes. And on the other side, if I want to interact with a different system, now that different system is New York. That's kind of I don't know Uniswap running on Polygon. Then to to that different system, I just appear as a normal Polygon address of some kind, and I can commit money or I can remove money. I can do whatever yeah. I could do in New York. Because I am appearing as a normal address. Okay, so just just to be very clear, so there's a couple of nuances we need to be very sure of. Okay, so as a zone manager, you might or might not allow uh, inter zone interactions, right? So because the risk uh, is more for zone manager, there might be agreements between inter zone. So imagine uh, Seb was one, Adrian was another one uh, zone manager. So they have an agreement. They allow and they have equivalency in compliance. Then they could allow us to. Like I could be in Sebastian's zone and you and Adrian's zone. We can actually have this transfer and we could be fine. And the thing that I think you are kind of referring to is an external one, right? The external one is like uh, we don't have a lot of control over it. We are assuming that you know these other things and we can only prove our innocence, right? The proof of innocence is our side. We can't prove innocence on their side because we don't know. I mean, assumption here is like they look at. Or the regulator looks at the other side, and the regulator has a view of the other side. I mean, the question here is being asked is, what is it that you have been doing? And we can definitely answer what we have been doing, the fullest required legal requirement in that sense. Th does it make sense? Kind of. So on a, on a high level, um, on a high level, it's like if there's a zone, a user can come, uh, they can comply with the rules for entering the zone and they entered the zone. They got some assets on a shielded address and they could use that shielded address to do some kind of more public transaction on the Uniswap running on Polygon. Deploy your strategy. Absolutely. Absolutely. But the zone, of course, cannot provide any kind of guarantee that that thing happening on the public transaction met certain rules of the of the land. It might break certain rules of the land. And, and of course, the zone cannot provide that guarantee. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. But if, absolutely the, right. if yes. the zone, if the transaction happens between two addresses inside the zone itself, for those, the zone manager can provide probably greater guarantees. Yeah, so the, the, the guarantee is cryptographic guarantee, right? Like all of this is cryptographic guarantees. There are no other guarantees of any kind. There's like no... No, trust me, bro. No, <laughs> this is all cryptographic guarantees. Everything that's happening, you have cryptographic security margin, and all our cryptographic security, right? Like, you know, privacy set is cryptographically bounded. Your security margin is cryptographically bounded. You know, all of those things. So it's like there is no such thing as like we are doing magic. Trust me, bro. No, everything we are doing, clearly articulated, cryptographically provided. The proof is visible to you. You as a user can actually validate it and you'd be happy with it. Right, right. So so in this whole journey where I started with a normal Polygon address, I moved into a a multi-asset uh, zone. Shield a, yeah. a shield zone. And then I, I got an address and then I did something on the Uniswap. I got a different asset that was also that also is now part of the shielded zone and then at some point i unshielded it and i went back to my to my normal address and in this whole flow there is un unlinkability the transaction that happened on uniswap on polygon and my original um original uh, address that transaction cannot be linked um, those two those two things cannot be linked by anyone that is not the KYC provider and not the zone administrator. Yeah, uh, yeah, and, and they can't do anything in that sense. So it's like if everybody colludes, right, then things could be possible. The, the person who could actually reveal everything is you. You can actually reveal things, right? If you as may have want to reveal things, you can. 
But you know, otherwise, because of the way we do KYT, uh, if KYT uh, you know provider has some transactional detail, you can correlate all those things. But that's like uh, you know, you need to go around the world, collect all the data, put all those things together. Yes, I mean, in the world, there is no such thing as perfect privacy. Transactional uh, traffic analysis implies people can uh, people can actually put things in the window. So cryptographically speaking, we try our level best. It's like a classic example I give. If there's a room and there's a door, and you can have a zero dollars proof that I have the ability to leave the room, right? If it's just me, <laughs> there's no privacy, right? There's a thousand people, you have one in a thousand chance that you can guess who it is. The same applies to, you know, Panther. If the privacy set is a thousand, or privacy set is 10,000, again, there's a trade-off, right? And I always describe to people this trade-off. So, you know, if you were to think about a circle and a square, uh, a circle, a base of this, and a square that fits in, the area of the square is always bigger than the circle, right? So when you have a curve and you straighten it out, in the area will come bigger. So effectively what happens is like when you do transactions, you will be forced to do batching because you have to do batching to provide privacy. Uh, that implies, you know, imagine an AMM, you, you have X and Y is a constant, you have a D Y by DX. Right, just that curve of the thing, it gets straightened out a bit. Right, that means that it's a you know that there's a small loss that's happening because the instantaneous price is not being available to everybody. Right, so this is the price we have to pay for providing privacy. So in a perfect world, unless your strategy has better alpha than this difference in curves, a plus the gas charges or the charges of doing whatever it is. But that's the challenge we will always have. You know. There is definitely that thing that that's why we actually have all the you know dark pools and the way they are willing to spend so much money to get uh, data centers right next to wherever the exchange is, and everybody gets the cabling wrapped. Uh, you know, I mean, literally, one should read that book on dark pools, and that that will give you the narrative. So there is a lot of money being made, right? And so you know, my expectation again, I haven't really tested this thesis out because I don't have. Like, there is no panther that exists right now, as you rightly pointed out, which you could actually do exactly what panther does. Like, we have provided all the tooling that one requires to do compliance, right? To best of our abilities, other than just this committee, right? Committee is a hard thing to implement because in a decentralized protocol, it's almost impossible to agree to a committee, get the committee to, you know, do all the crap, right? But everything else has been done. Now, the thing is, like, you could easily do all these things and the assumption on the other side is that there's a value that trade five sees in dark pool that they will actually see in doing transactions and deploying strategies into DeFi, right? I mean, it, I think of it as like a multi-legged uh, strategies, right? I'm sure you have seen a whole bunch of them, right? And here is like there is a good amount of alpha to be made in multi-legged strategies, right? And uh, you know, imagine Panther were deployed in multiple EVM compatible ones. You can actually go across. I said, going back to your zone manager question, the zone managers agree that these transactions are allowed and you get KYC in all the different ones, whichever you decide. And then you can do all of this across all the zones and make your money. I mean, there's nothing stopping you. I mean, yes, there is a small chance that you have to pay the gas fees for doing all these things, plus any protocol fees that is incurred, you have to pay, but otherwise... Whatever you know, the the thing I I normally say to every L1 uh, you know founder is like, look, what Panda provides you is the ability for you to do whatever you want to do in a private sense, and you keep ninety ninety nine plus x of all the value that you create. What Panda or similar protocols will do is like they charge you because you can't do it for free. Somebody has to pay for having to run all these things, right? So that need, fee need to be paid, but otherwise, all the alpha everybody creates is accrued on the L1. And L1s and L2s are the biggest winners, and the users are the biggest winners. And we, as a protocol provider, we, we just, oh, uh, you know, I should probably say to a large extent, this has been a, a very much a passion project. So I conceptually understand the kind of party that, that will be a KYC provider. This is a party that has probably some kind of automated systems where you upload a driving license and they're able to verify that it's genuine or not. They, they are specializing in technology like that. They, be, they make good KYC providers. I, I don't understand what kind of 
party in the real world is going to be this zone administrator is it like a tradfi institution we are looking it at it could be somebody who has a you know virtual as a service provider license right so you know day, day one we are probably going to use a dao as a initial uh, you know, uh, zone manager but in a in a world where we have a protocol being successful anybody who actually wants to do something startle between the two worlds who has a license to do this so the, the reason i say this is like it's a regulatory issue right we could just have this thing running on its own headless in that sense but because of the way we actually want to have this ability for the regulators to talk to everybody there needs to be somebody responsible right so you need to have to have somebody who they could go to and ask okay who are all the people who could actually provide kyc and why what was your criteria and then you have to provide them with okay so when they have a in, interaction with the regulators regulators say okay if you want to do this these are the kyc providers they go yep yeah. so you the regulator ask me to do this and here is a, you know the certificate that you know uh, or, or this letter of intent what are that is that the interaction between the two parties so that the, the parties are very clear as to what the regulatory requirement was and how it was agreed and how things were done so you know otherwise what will happen is because we have to deal with the so called traditional finance world we need to have some sort of an equivalence so you know this is like a possible equivalence mechanism still there's a bit of lack of clarity in terms of who exactly would be that because we don't know like we are talking to like a bunch of people there have been different levels of interest you know in an ideal world as somebody who really understands this if they come back come, come up to us that'd be pretty awesome because like you know we build everything right as i was saying he like my expertise is very much research and building right i'm good at thinking about protocols i'm getting it putting together a team designing a protocol getting it to a place where it can run i am not a marketing guy i am not a bd guy that's my co-founder right so you know very the two of us that's how it is so i can only say to you that you know we will definitely take the host to the water but the host is going to drink or not is a dilute to the host cool so so how does it work so when i when i go from a normal address to a shielded address um what's the underlying technological engine that's that's making it real? very simple it's a very simple mechanism uh, you know it's a fist of the five circuits there's a, a you know a map that exists from your address to a new address right so you could actually prove that this is the address that you you have and that's it that's that's how you get mapped to the new address so when you come back from the kyc provider then there's this as a knowledge mechanism that actually maps you from your fist of addresses to the new address right and that's the fist set so guess that other and there are like a, a few trees that we have like a there's a static tree then a bus a taxi and the other i can't remember the name of the tree there are four trees that are there so essentially uh, you know all the data for a zone is like in the static tree plus the zone manager contains all the things so effectively any any data that need to be there is all updated there and all the rest of it get updated into trees and that's it so essentially all of this are kind of merkle trees in lucent because it's a utx so thing these are all merkle trees right so you have an address that's been created so that will map to uh, a utx so in a merkle tree that says and there's a map between the two that's kind of you know shielded by the normal zero knowledge mechanism right so you can actually you know, if you so decide you want you want to be really can but you know and, 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 and no, nobody else can actually do that right um uh, that's cool that's cool so so anish you have a version 1 um minute launch coming in the next couple of months right yeah yeah i mean like i would say it's more six to eight weeks okay so i'll give you a full disclosure uh, we have our um audit uh, started with veridice i think it's two weeks now a week or two i mean i'm traveling so i'm i'm pretty bad don't hold me responsible for the slipping days so when that's complete assuming there are no major bugs we are very close to you know there are two uh, three more phases at best that need to be released so we can actually release it to the mainnet and wo- and what will be part of this first mainnet okay 
So let me look at my notes. So I'm going to look at my notes and tell you what's there. So, you know, stage one is the Z account registration. So this is the first set that you were describing, right? Then there's this, okay, there is some, I should probably describe, that there is the privacy staking mechanism, which I kind of mentioned in passing, but uh, it's the mechanism by which you actually uh, reward people for providing privacy, right? And we have this construct, uh, which is like a ZZKP, just like an internal thing to provide privacy. Otherwise, there's this linking that is possible. So that is also in V1. So I'm, I'm just imagining it as accounts that are creating transactional activity on a zone uh, just so that genuine economic activity can be masked inside that kind of fake transactional activity happening in that zone. Yeah, I mean, it could be you are doing transactions which are real transactions, but you need to have enough of transactions, right? It doesn't have to be fake in that sense. There is no need to do fakes, right? You just need to do transactions. If you do real transactions, it's even better, right? So the overall privacy set increases. So imagine there's a thousand people and thousand people are deploying various things on Uniswap. You have a privacy set of a thousand straight up, right? That's what it is. And all of you will get your rewards uh, from uh, doing all these things. And then there's a map between this. So this is part of the V1 functionality. Then a shielding, so essentially what we were describing. Uh, then uh, you know, transfers between uh, internal to MASP, so between you know you and I in that sense. Uh, then there is like a, a Z accounts directory service, so you can actually get some idea of where things are. Uh, then intra MASP transfers and messages. Okay, so you could uh, transfer between two MASP. I remember we were talking about. New York and San Francisco, yeah, going Mehen back to your example. as part yeah. of one of these zones with one administrator, Anish being another zone, another administrator being able to exchange assets across zones, provided the rules of the two zones match in some way. Absolutely, yes. And then uh, it, it, it's like, a, we call it a bundler. So, you know, when the transaction happens, somebody needs to put all these things together. That's, uh, you know, we could call it a miner or a bundler. So that's one of the things that need to be have built. And that I told you about like, a, you know, different kind of um, trees that are there for trees. So there's a tree called a taxi tree. So that, uh, then the bus tree, and then I can't remember the uh, a ferry tree, okay? And then there's a last tree, I can't remember the name of the tree. Then uh, withdrawals, basic disclosures, and Z account renewal, right? So. Withdrawals is like you want to withdraw something. Uh, you know, basic disclosure is you did a transaction you want to reveal. And Z account renewal is like KYC. You remember our conversation about KYC? We have uh, KYC is uh, ephemeral. They are not permanent, right? So you have to renew. Okay. So then we have a uh, DeFi swap. Essentially, there's an adapter to your, you know, a protocol. That's a DeFi protocol. So we can do that. So there's something we call advanced disclosures. So um, it's like it's kind of hard to describe it in simple terms, but essentially you have uh, ways by which you can reveal bits of things, right? So disclosure is like a commit reveal mechanism. Advanced disclosure is like you want to reveal some bits of it, right? And uh, increasing the number of assets that need to be there. So the number of assets that are there is kind of limited. So we are kind of you know adding more and more assets. Uh, so last of the bits is uh, what we call an involuntary disclosure. So this is uh, if it's required that, uh, you know, if authorities come in and all the parties, uh, you know, agree to do what they need to do, then they can actually construct certain pieces. And uh, then there's uh, Z-Trade, which is what I was describing uh, between the two of us, and then migration from 0.5 to 1. That is, yeah, I think that's pretty much... I think I described all of it. Actually, there's a huge, there's a huge list, list of features. There's a huge list of features. Yeah, we've been working very hard. Uh, it's been working very hard. So I should give my team the credit, right? Like uh, I, I talk nonsense to them, get whiteboards, uh, draw things. They actually go, come back, you know, look at it and come back to me. And yeah, I'm very lucky to have a very good team. Yeah, of course, like the flip side of it is because it's a huge list of features, there would be like unexpected behaviors where people will end up leaking information that they thought was safe and things like that. It is possible we will have to, yeah. It is very possible we might find things, yeah, 
oh yeah we didn't think this people could do this wow <laughs> yeah that's very possible but you know we are optimistic yeah so it's like important to start small important for users to to start with small amounts and test test yeah. on the system yeah absolutely i mean the overall the protocol is kind of limited to 1000 bucks so you know uh, that, that that's a whole idea the idea is like you know minimal kyc minimal amount of transactions so you could actually get used and people can get used to vanta and then when panther is much more known to people and people are used to the behavior they can then they can, the, the the world is their oyster they can build their strategies and deploy it and go to what they want i am actually curious um there's an element to such a protocol which is there's a massive element which is okay how do you even conceive of and like build this thing which you have solved but the other problematic part is distribution getting people to actually use it which is a very different problem <laughs> so are there any um breakthroughs or successes in that dimension like xoy parties committing to use panther in a certain way so yeah i mean i i have to admit like you know i have been mostly the person responsible for the fist part right i'm the co-founder cto and the chief scientist has been thinking about the problem and i've actually delegated the bd i mean we worked together but in the larger sense you know the conversations i had uh, either one of us and uh, my co-founder so there have been a bunch of conversations that's been there uh, we have a uh, lot of interest from various parties we are in conversation with coinbase and other people so i don't know like you know it's between you know talking and signing the contract right so you see so definitely there are multiple parties that we have been talking to uh, you know uh, i i can't name names but definitely there are three at least more than five people that we have been talking to like uh, who have a possible you know kind of institutional kind of is somewhere in the spectrum right so that's the uh, th- that's the thinking the thinking is like what are these people who are institution you know what i wouldn't call it institutional because institutional would require a lot more than panther could actually do right now right so the idea here is like get panther panther has been aimed at this uh, space in the market where you know retail users all the way up to say you know minimal family offices who have minimal regulatory requirements can actually go use that's where we are aiming at but if you want to go beyond where we go to like traditional you know hardcore set of people that will require a lot more heavy lifting right like you know all the integrations and everything which i think it will take a while but you know the idea here is getting people who are from standard retail investors to people who run family offices with minimal regulatory requirement the kyc kyt you know, tax returns that's the kind of thing that you are required to you know fulfill that's the idea getting them on board it i mean we are also giving people incentives right like to you know play with the protocol so in, in the initial plan is to you know pretty much a largest chunk of the protocol uh, you know tokens were allocated out to give everybody incentives right so you know, the idea here is like if the protocol succeeds everybody who participates succeeds so that you know assumption here is like a there is some need for users the average join the street who understands what privacy is and has some strategies that they want to deploy would like to use a protocol like panther and b given the regulatory you know landscape that the utility function of regulation is quite high and people want to have you know things in the right manner right and that's b and c is that given uh, there is you know some slight expenses that effectively you have to pay for the gas fees and all the things right there will be a fee and the assumption here is like the alpha that people have is bigger than the fee so it really makes economic sense for them to actually do this and the friction is within acceptable bounds these are all assumptions that's been making so anish is it correct to understand that the fee is there because okay the underneath polygon is charging something but in a sense because in order to provide um privacy you have to incentivize people to do transactions that might sometimes be fake somebody needs to pay for those transactions to happen which reflects as a fee on the genuine users of the panther protocol right yes absolutely you're absolutely right yes 
You're spot on. Thank you. Yes. It's like a fee for cover traffic in a sense. You you you. Yes, absolutely. That's that's yeah. That's that's one way to think about it. Like you know, there has to be a fee that allows the ecosystem to have a policy of some game, right? So otherwise, it would be like a you know ne- you know it's a tragedy of commons. So we have a problem with tragedy of commons at that. So, so that's why we have a fee structure. The fee structure would allow you know a fee to be you know levied on the users and given out to everybody who helps the ecosystem to uh, to flourish because you know it's in the best interest of everybody in the ecosystem to provide uh, you know privacy and, and you know it'll be a loose loose if everybody starts revealing their set right so that's the whole idea i mean it's okay if you reveal it to your you know regulators and in the you know your the the, the, the construct here is like you did your transactions end of the year you all reveal everything to your tr- regulators not a problem because like you know your strategy you can have it for a whole year right you run your strategy you made your money you submit your tax returns everything is fine now you can't go ahead and use the same strategy tomorrow because now you know IRS has access to all of this and you know who knows what happens right so you have the panther uh, token and tell us about how these were distributed and um and you know what is the tokenomics how many tokens and Oh gosh, that, 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 that's a tricky bit. I can't have it top my head, but I will describe it to you. It's been a bit while since I last worked on it. As I was saying, like you know, uh, as the person who you know puts a lot of this in one's head, a lot of the things skip my mind, right? So you have buckets of problems as they go. It's like a bucket of problems where you need to talk to the regulators to make sure what you're doing meets whatever it is. A bucket of problems where you look at zk and the progress in zk. A bucket of problems in DeFi, where you look at DeFi and solve that, and then there is other things that you did in the past, right? So, in terms of tokenomics, what has happened is like an early model was produced in 2020, 2021. So we had like a bunch of private sales. So you know, both me and my co-founder put in our own money. A bunch of our friends put in money, and then we had a public sale in 2021. And then you know, uh, the tokens. Uh, there's this. A fraction between 10 to 15 percent of it was allocated to the team. Uh, 10 to 15 percent was allocated to the foundation. So there's a foundation that actually is supposed to, you know, look after this. So the foundation is based in Gibraltar. Uh, then this uh, whole bunch of tokens has been allocated to, you know, providing uh, rewards for, you know, the thing that you were describing, which is essentially providing privacy set. Then a small bit of tokens were allocated to actually help build the ecosystem. So this is kind of how it was overall made out. And it was a very long curve. It's like an emission curve for, us for like 144 months, if I'm not mistaken, 12 years. So we kind of thought about it for like, you know, in my mind, if a protocol would take that long, uh, it's not the optimal place to be, right? My expectation is, that, you know, maybe a year, maybe two years. Before that, it should reach the equilibrium. Equilibrium means there's enough of fees that's coming into the protocol that the protocol is self-sustaining. So once that happens, then the emission doesn't really matter, right? Like emission is just an emission. It doesn't really make any difference because, uh, you know, fees in this thing makes it sustainable. So that's that's the thinking. Perfect. And I'm actually curious on... Um, what is the fee making model of Panther? So I'll, I'll define my question better. So, in your protocol, you have like different parties. So the KYC provider, the zone administrator, the user that's shielding. Probably in the future, the regulator might itself have some kind of powers, etc. Oh, if they decide. If they yeah. decide, right? <laughs> yes. So and and of course, it is pretty obvious that the user will pay for uh, pay for privacy, right? The so if if I'm on Polygon and I interact with Uniswap without Panther, my cost is X. But if I interact via Panther, it is X plus Y, and that Y, you can imagine that Y is paid for this cover traffic or this extra economic pra- activity that Panther protocol. A whole bunch of things, right? It, 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 it's to pay for the gas fees for running the zk. Uh, it is also to provide like uh, you know things that are required. Uh, also to provide cover traffic. Oh, everything, right? Like you need to think of it like, you know, uh, in one sense, the, they need to be, in my head, sometimes I think of it like you need to build upgrades. So if you are very successful, what you need to happen is that you should go to the DAO. Uh, you, sh- you you know, users of the DAO should be able to put a proposal. 
just like, okay, you need to actually improve this from whatever this is to that. So, you know, that this is all list of all things that you want to do. The cost of all of that needs to be underwritten over time by fees, but otherwise it's kind of impossible. Like you can't have a loss making mechanism to be able to deliver services to everybody. That, that That's the whole idea. Right. So do you intend to charge the user, like you intend to charge the user, but do you also intend to charge the zone administrator as well? Because in a sense, that zone as zone administrator is a financial service provider. And is there a business model to be made on their side too? Uh, we haven't really thought that through in that sense because it's like it is very possible that if you were to create a, a particular zone which is like very internal to yourself and nothing to do with like an external protocols, maybe, right? The assumption here is like, you know, this is a public good, right? In my head, it is public good. Privacy for protocols is public good, right? And we need to support it and we need to be as, as in like users of the, the ecosystem, right? And that's the way we are thinking. But if it's like separate and completely segregated and the zone manager runs this you know, in, in a very different world, you know, the value of public good to you and me as an average user to the ecosystem is diminishing. Maybe there's a case to be had, right? We haven't come across anybody who said this to us. You, we want to do something that you would never be able to interact with. It is very possible they might do that, right? They might have uh, some sort of a, what do we call a hybrid kind of chain that they use for something and they want to deploy Panther and they want to, you know, be a zone manager. Well, yes, they can be. In that instance, yes, that's a different instance, right? So, you know, we are not, you and me as an average, uh, you know, L1, L2 user is not getting anything out of it. Cool. Um, so we are coming to the end of the conversation, Anish. Uh, would you like to tell our listeners where they could find more about the Panther Protocol and what are interesting resources? Oh, okay, so the thing would be, uh, it, it, you know, if you go to Panther Protocol that IO, is Panther Protocol IO, we have a bunch of things there. Then there's Docs Panther Protocol that's there as well. Then there are a bunch of blogs there as well. So and they explain a bunch of talks that's been given mostly by me and members of our team. So we've, you know, I should have said, we've actually done a bit more work in the ZK space as such. We've been, uh, you know, active in the Z Prize. Uh, we've actually published uh, a ZK snack scheme of our own. We have an IBC scheme of our own. Like we've done a bunch of things. So, you know, there are a couple of preprints that's available. So, you know, fe feel free to, you know, uh, look around. If you have any difficulty, uh, there, there, there's our community manager. His name is Yoris. And if you want to get hold of him, it's uh, Zok780 on Telegram. And he would definitely respond to any of those things. If everything fails, then uh, drop me an email. I'm Anish at PantherProtocol.io. Or oh, I'm Zero Knowledge on Telegram. Cool. Thanks, Anish, for the, for the interview. And I look forward to trying Panther. Most welcome. Thank you.